Hello, everybody. This is Sean Carroll. We're going to give a couple minutes uh, for people to wander in. I will use those minutes to give out some instructions. We're very happy to have Netta Engelhardt here as our colloquium speaker today. I'll introduce Netta in a second. But first, um, I believe it is the case that we've turned off the ability for you to show your videos. So my video will, will be on so Netta can see it <laughs> so that she's not just giving a talk to a bunch of uh, names. But uh, the rest of you will not have your videos on. I'll ask you to turn off your, your audio, although I think that happens automatically. We are going to be taking questions at the end, of course. So you can, you should, if you want to ask a question, hit the raise hand button in Zoom, which you can do from the participants tab. And I will choose people to call on to actually ask their questions. Hopefully, you can ask questions via audio. If not, there is a Q and A box uh, that you can type questions into also. So hopefully, that will all go smoothly. We're all new at this. Be patient. God isn't finished with us yet. Uh, but I think that uh, both uh, Netta and I, and of course, Kobe, have done this enough times that it should be pretty good. So we're very happy today to have uh, Netta Engelhardt visit us from MIT. Netta got her PhD from Santa Barbara, uh, UC Santa Barbara, not that long ago. She's now assistant professor at MIT after a stint uh, as a postdoc in Princeton. And uh, she works on a bunch of interesting things in quantum information, gravity, quantum gravity, which you'll hear about. Uh, I think the most exciting thing to mention about Netta is that she recently shared the New Horizons in Physics Prize with Ahmed Almeri, Henry Maxfield, and Jeff Pennington for calculating the quantum information content of a black hole and its radiation. I suspect we will hear something about that today. And so with that, uh, let's turn it over to Netta. All right, can everyone hear me and or see me? Yes, great, okay. Uh, well, thank you, Sean, for the very lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be at Caltech in so much as I am at Caltech right now. And uh, this is a colloquium that was meant to be delivered last March, but unfortunately was prevented by the pandemic. And um, it's nice to give at least a substitute for it, even though this is remote and not in person. So uh, it's nice to be at least be able to tell you some of this remotely. Um, okay, so in general, I've been very excited to give talks on this subject these past few months, really this past uh, year and a half, because we're in a very exciting time period regarding the black hole information paradox. Now, I uh, titled this talk, The Black Hole Information Paradox in the Age of Holographic Entanglement Entropy. And this age of holographic entanglement entropy appears here because, in my opinion, the appropriate use of this tool, holographic entanglement entropy, is really what's ushering in a new era of what we can do and what we can learn about quantum gravity from the black hole information paradox. So I want to begin today by actually taking a bit of a step back and providing a little bit of motivation about why we study the black hole information paradox. And then from there, I'll move on to what it is, what is the black hole information paradox, and what does it mean to be in the age of holographic entanglement entropy? Why, does that, why is that important for us? Why has that helped us and continues to help us in our quest to resolve the black hole information paradox? So this talk will be primarily about what we don't know, but I'm going to begin on the firmer ground with what we know. So what do we know? Well, we know a lot of things, but here are just a few. We know that general relativity is not a complete theory of gravitational phenomena. So general relativity predicts quite generically that if you, that if you take some set of initial data in gravity and you evolve it in time, eventually it's going to reach a situation where you have very large curvatures of space-time on a very small scales, which is to say you're going to have a situation where you have large curvatures on scales where quantum mechanics becomes important. Examples of regimes like this are the deep interior of black holes, the pre-inflationary universe. These are regimes where general relativity breaks down. Why does it break down? Well, it breaks down because an effective description of a limit where general relativity and quantum field theory are kind of neighbors, 
they're neighbors and they're not, they don't really talk to each other very much. Uh, that's not really going to cut it anymore. We need a quantum theory of gravity to describe these regimes. And I want to be quite clear on this point, which is that we are pretty convinced now that black holes do exist and that the inflationary universe was preceded by something. And that means that our model of the universe, our understanding of the universe is incomplete without a description of these phenomena. And in order to describe these phenomena to provide a complete description of the universe, we do need a quantum theory of gravity. So we want to describe these phenomena. However, there's a potential snag here, which is that we don't have a self-consistent, direct, non-perturbative formulation of quantum gravity, which is what we need to describe these things. So we know all of these things. We know that we don't have this. We know that general relativity is not everything that there is. Let's move on to some stuff that we don't know. So here's a beautiful image by the LIGO collaboration. And I quote by uh, Franz Cordova, black holes are the most mysterious objects in the universe. Something we don't know, something we don't understand, but really would like to, as I said, as I said just a slide ago, is the black hole interior. Now it comes as no surprise, given what I said in the last slide, that the black hole interior is something we don't understand, the deep black hole interior, because we expect it's ruled by this mysterious quantum theory of gravity. Where the black hole information, com information paradox comes in is in actually telling us that even in regimes that we might have expected that the standard description of the universe as being more or less general relativity and quantum field theory that only barely talk to each other, that they're weakly coupled, that that actually is not enough to describe regimes in which we think it should be. So to be a little bit more explicit, we may need input from quantum gravity to understand physics at the event horizon, where normally we would expect semi-classical gravity is valid. What we mean by that is the event horizon of say a large black hole has very small space-time curvature. So we don't expect that quantum gravity is really important for describing that regime. We expect that it's well described by this weakly coupled limit of general relativity and quantum field theory. And the black hole information paradox is a statement that, that doesn't it seem, it doesn't seem to work that way. So even though it's not surprising that quantum gravity is important for describing the, big, the deep black hole interior, it's pretty surprising that we might need it to describe something like the event horizon. And this is, of course, one of the reasons that we think of this as something that we don't understand it, we don't know why. And one of the reasons it comes with the, uh, the word paradox in the name. So this is a bit of motivation. Now, what, what is the black hole information paradox? Very roughly, I'll give a much more precise description in a little bit. So the black hole information paradox is an apparent contradiction between the predictions of semi-classical gravity, so more or less classical general relativity with very small corrections uh, at the event horizon of a black hole and unitarity of quantum mechanics. So again, this is a regime where we expect that there's no problem between these two theories because they don't really talk to each other very much. But the black hole information paradox is telling us, no, actually, they, apparently they do. And that's very surprising. Now, of course, the reason that we, uh, that we care about this, and that's the, that's the why, which will come in a little bit more precisely later, is that this is telling us something interesting and important about quantum gravity. Now, here's a caricature that you might hear in an elevator pitch about the black hole information paradox. You have uh, two observers, Alice and Bob. Maybe they're entangled. Alice ends up inside the black hole, and Bob doesn't end up inside the black hole. And so far, well, we, we haven't really done anything interesting, but if the black hole evaporates, then Alice is gone from the universe. And what seems to happen is that information is lost. In what sense is it lost? It's lost in the sense that Bob and Alice together were in a, what's called a pure state, and they later became just just became Bob, who's in a mixed state, which is a gross violation of unitarity of quantum mechanics. We call that information loss, and I'll make it clear why we call that information loss in a little bit. That's the uh, this 30-second pitch 
on what the black hole information paradox is. Now, I'll, again, I'll say a lot more about it later, but that's the basic what. So what about the why? This slide is titled Information Paradox, What and Why? I alluded to this just a couple of uh, minutes ago. The information paradox has a lot to teach us about quantum gravity. We're not really interested in it for its own sake. We're interested in it because the existence of a paradox tells us that there's something wrong about the way that we're thinking about the combination of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Nature doesn't have paradoxes, it, things happen. Uh, and so that means that we have to understand what is it about our description of this of the system, the evaporating black hole, what are we missing? What is flawed in our description? And so this paradox is a way of pinpointing where we are going wrong in our quest for a quantum theory of gravity. So there is a bit of a catch-22 here, which is that we are hoping that we can use insights in the black hole information paradox to get more insight into quantum gravity. But of course, who's to say that we can ever understand or come close to resolving the black hole information paradox without first having quantum gravity. It's quite possible that we, that we wouldn't in principle, maybe that's what you would expect. And of course, what uh, this talk is, uh, is about is to tell you that actually uh, we can make progress on this without having a full direct quantum, non-perturbative quantum theory of gravity. So a little bit about the history, the information paradox then and now. What do I mean by then versus now? I think there's a, there's a turning point, which is May 2019. And I'm associating this, this two different eras, before and after that. Uh, before is the then, and now is what happened since then. So as a general rule, the information paradox acts like a lot of aspects of physics, where you have a history of long periods of silence and short periods of frantic activity. Now, I would say, at least in my field, the black hole information paradox that is a particular problem where the silent periods are particularly silent and the periods of frantic activity are uh, sort of like chronic or delta functions. They're extremely frantic and usually fairly brief. And one of the things that have been very exciting this past year and a half is that the developments just keep on coming. So uh, there's the hope that maybe, maybe this is not another one of those delta functions, but the slow roll to progress. So I keep on saying the before and after. So what was, uh, what was this key difference in, uh, in what we thought before and uh, pre-2019 and now? The, I would say the, an accepted viewpoint, the conventional viewpoint, was that unitarity of black hole evaporation, which is to say conservation of information, is something that we could only see, we could only calculate if we had access to non-perturbative quantum gravity. In other words, if we wanted to calculate a litmus test of unitarity in black hole evaporation, we would need non-perturbative quantum gravity dynamics, the quantum gravity calculations. And that if, as, as long as we work with just semi-classical gravity, as long as all of our calculations are done just in semi-classical gravity, then we look like we are losing information. So what, what's, the, what's the difference? Well, the new results in May 2019 is a purely semi-classical analysis that contains this litmus test of or hallmark uh, of information conservation. And I think most of us thought that this was impossible. So it was extremely exciting that we could do this. And in fact, it's also lived up to the expectation that a breakthrough on the information paradox front would actually also lead us to having way more insight into, the, uh, into quantum gravity and not just understanding black hole information paradox better. So here is the outline of this talk. First, I'm going to talk about the information paradox as I call it then. And I'll talk about the history of it and a little bit more precisely, what do we mean by information loss and information conservation and why information loss is such a catastrophic prospect. And then I'll introduce the new tools, the holographic entanglement entropy and how we use them. Then I'll talk about the information paradox now, what happened in May 2019 and everything that followed. And I'll even be audacious enough to have a speculative section on what I think will happen for the black hole information paradox in the coming future. So let me begin my story. And 
It begins as stories in physics often do in thermodynamics. So this here is a very famous thought experiment of Wheeler's. It, is, it takes in two ingredients. The first is a fact about general relativity. Black holes have no microstates. Now, if an object has no microstates, well, it has no entropy. So Wheeler's thought experiment went like this. He said, let me take a cup of hot tea, which certainly has entropy, and I'm gonna throw it into a black hole. Now, since a black hole has no microstates, I've taken entropy and I have reduced it. So I have decreased the entropy of the universe by taking my cup of hot tea and throwing it into the black hole. And as a counterpoint to that, let me bring up one of my favorite quotes about uh, physics, which is by Sir Arthur Eddington. If your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. So I would say uh, Wheeler was deeply bothered by this and Anybody would have been, we would like, we like general relativity, we'd like to keep it. It's a beautiful theory that describes the world very nicely. So, uh, so, so then Wheeler went to his graduate student, Jacob Beckenstein, and he gave him a problem. Explain to me how we can essentially have general relativity, which says no black hole microstates, and thermodynamics. And whenever I think of the story, I think that I'm being a little bit too easy on my own graduate students. Now, Jacob Beckenstein actually lived up to the challenge and he came up with the following resolution. He said, actually, black holes are thermal objects. They have a temperature and they do have an entropy. It's just that this entropy isn't due to classical general relativity microstates. This entropy is due to quantum gravity microstates. And it is given by the area of the event horizon over four G Newton H bar. So this was his explanation. Sure, maybe GR doesn't have classical microstates for black holes, for black holes, but quantum gravity, quantum gravity does. And this is the entropy of a black hole. And furthermore, for a black hole close to equilibrium, it has a temperature which is inversely proportional to its mass. Now, there is something here which is very important, which is the quantum effects. As I mentioned before, black holes do not have an entropy in classical general relativity. This is something that's due to quantum gravity microstates. And in fact, black holes also don't have a temperature in classical gravity. It doesn't, this, this statement that black holes are thermal objects doesn't actually make sense as anything more than an analogy in classical gravity because objects with temperature have to emit radiation and black holes in classical general relativity are perfect absorbers. They don't emit radiation. So it's critically important here, and we'll come back to this fact later, that in order to have it to, for the black hole to have a temperature, we need to work in what I'm calling semi-classical gravity, by which I mean not strictly classical gravity, but it's not, not completely decoupled quantum field theory and gravity, but weakly coupled. So a perturbative quantum gravity where the two theories are allowed to interact, but very weakly. So let's talk a little bit about these evaporating black holes that I mentioned earlier. So black holes are thermal, that means they should radiate. If the temperature of the black hole is hotter than its ambient surroundings, then as it radiates, it's going to shrink and lose mass. But the, here's the funny thing about black holes, their temperature is inversely proportional to their mass. So as the black hole evaporates, it gets hotter, and so it doesn't stop evaporating until it's completely gone. So I find that when you describe a process like this that sounds kind of abstract, it's helpful to have some numbers. So for example, Sagittarius A star with current estimates has a temperature of 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. That's very cold, a lot colder than the cosmic microwave background. There is also the possibility of a solar mass black hole. So that would have temperature 10 to the minus eight Kelvin. A lunar mass black hole would be at equilibrium with the cosmic microwave background. And finally, just for kicks, a coronavirus-sized black hole would, have a, would be at room temperature. And I'm sure that there are some conspiracy theorists out there who would really love to have this information. All right, so let's talk about collapsing black holes. I know that this past slide was evaporating black holes, but in order to talk about evaporating black holes, it's helpful to first discuss the opposite process, which is more intuitive, which is collapsing black holes. So 
I'm going to present a schematic diagram of black hole collapse here. So this time runs up along this over here. This here is meant to represent a star. I know it doesn't look much like one, but I'm, I'm here representing this, basically this circle as a sphere, which is meant to be a star. Now let's imagine the star is collapsing under the force of a gravitational field, of its own gravitational field. So as time goes by, it shrinks. So its radius shrinks and it is collapsing in on itself and eventually it enters its Schwarzschild radius and we have an event horizon. So this here is the star shrinking and then we have formed an event horizon here. As time goes by, the star continues to collapse until eventually we get this jagged line here, which is the so-called singularity where uh, essentially everything, uh, the space-time curvature is divergent and general relativity predicts its own demise at the singularity. So what is the observer's experience in this situation? And I'm sure many of you have seen diagrams of this before, so I'll just remind you what that looks like. So here, imagine you're an observer standing here far outside of the black hole and you're holding a flashlight and your flashlight is shining out and you ask, where, where can the light go? Well, this is your light cone. So this is where all the where light rays can travel, which means that you, as someone who travels not quite as fast as light, you are only able to travel, <clears throat> excuse me, within your light cone. As you approach the event horizon, your light cones tilt and they tilt towards the horizon, which means if you're sitting here and you're looking at what your flashlight is doing, the light rays are traveling like this. So you have to travel within this light cone. Now, if you're standing at the event horizon, your light cone is completely tilted into the interior of the black hole. And there's just, there's a, one light ray here, which can just stay on the event horizon. This is of course what we mean when we say that not even light can escape from a black hole. It's just the effect of the light cone being tilted so that everything must proceed inside. And your future, which is everything inside the cone, is entirely inside the black hole. And as you keep on going into the black hole, your light cone, just tilts over. So this is the, uh, the causal experience of an observer who is falling into the black hole. So much for collapsing black holes. Now let's talk about black hole evaporation. So here we had our black hole, so the diagram from before, and now the event horizon begins to shrink in size. So the black hole is shrinking in size, the event horizon shrinks in radius. Eventually there's some explosion Stephen Hawking titled his original paper on black hole evaporation, black hole explosions. And, uh, the, and then the black hole is gone. Here we have two, these two arrows, these yellow arrows denote the Alice and Bob of before. So one of them ends up inside the black hole. One of them stays outside the black hole. Eventually the black hole evaporates and only this one is left in the universe. And so the paradox, the black hole information paradox, is what appears to be information loss between the state of the universe here at this time and the state of the universe over here. You can formulate it also for intermediate times, but I will not be doing that here. So to see information loss between the early and the initial state and the post evaporation state, one thing which is very helpful to do is to talk about the entropy of the black hole's radiation, which we call Hawking radiation. So let's, uh, let's talk about it in this sort of very dramatically oversimplified model. It's less, it's less oversimplified than, the, than Alice and Bob though. So we've, we've, gone, we've, got, we've gotten a little bit better there. So let's take an entangled pair where, so here we have some bell pair and we have some, uh, say the left particles, left particle is behind the event horizon and the right particle stays outside of the event horizon. Now we can ask, this is the state of the two particles together they're entangled. We can also ask what is the state of the right particle by itself? Now we can't describe it strictly as a state as a vector in a Hilbert space. We have to describe it by a density matrix because it's in a mixed state which is entangled with the left particle. So now we want to use entanglement entropy, we want the entropy of the Hawking radiation to diagnose information loss or conservation of this Bell pair. How do we do this? Well, we're going to use the von Neumann entropy, which some people also call the entanglement entropy, which some people call the fine-grained entropy, which is defined as minus trace rho log rho, where rho here is the density matrix of your system. 
Why do we use this quantity? Well, it has a number of very nice properties. First, it's invariant under unitary evolution. So if we're testing whether we have unitarity or not, one thing we can test is whether this thing stays constant. It also vanishes for a pure state and only for a pure state. So the only way that the Neumann entropy is zero is if your density matrix rho can be written like this, as a pure state. Well, that's also very nice because if we start with a pure state where the entropy is zero, we should also end up, if we have unitary evolution, with a state whose entropy is again zero. And finally, this is bounded from above by the thermal entropy, which is also called the coarse-grained entropy. So these three properties are going to be very useful for us to try to track down what it means for, to have unitary evolutions, but it's a litmus test for unitary evolution of the Hawking radiation. Now, why do we call it information loss versus information conservation? This is some very rough intuition. Now we can quantify, again, in sort of a rough way, the information in a state in terms of the difference between the thermal entropy and the von Neumann entropy. The, in the sense in which the thermal state is at equilibrium and essentially has no information content. And so if your system evolves to progressively larger von Neumann entropy, then this difference is shrinking. Now, since the von Neumann entropy is bounded from above by the thermal entropy, that means that it can never exceed it. But as it approaches it, we say that you are losing information. You're losing information about the system. Now, alternatively, another way to think about this is why this is information loss. If you think of a pure state as the entire system, as a closed system, this is the entire system. And you can do this because a mixed state can always be purified by adding an additional system to it. Then you can think of the von Neumann entropy in some sense as a rough guide for how short we are of having the quote unquote entire system or the full system. So there are two different perspectives on um, why, what we, what, why we say that uh, this information loss versus conservation, that we can measure that using the von Neumann entropy. Now, sometimes I, uh, I hear the complaint uh, that this happens all the time, that you have some tabletop experiment, perhaps, and your system begins as a pure state, and eventually it ends up in basically something that looks like a thermal state. And the reason, of course, is that it interacts with its surroundings. An open system will interact with the surroundings, it will settle down to a thermal state, and it'll lose information along the way. And of course, this is not a violation of quantum mechanics because open systems just don't evolve unitarily. But we do expect that closed systems do. And the entire universe is not an open system. By definition, we say we take the entire universe, then that's literally everything there is. If for it to be open, that means there's another system out there somewhere. So the entire system is not an open, the entire universe is not an open system, which tells us that we do expect to have unitary evolution. So now that we have this intuition behind what unitary evolution, why that corresponds in some way to, um, to this information loss versus information conservation, why unitary evolution is information conservation and non-unitary evolution is information loss, then uh, let's take a look at this very simplistic Hawking radiation model in terms of this Bell pair. So the initial state of the pair was pure, right? We had this, um, let me just go back up. We had this Bell pair, this is a pure state. The initial state psi is a pure state. That means that the von Neumann entropy is zero. So basically the, we, we have a lot of information about the system. We, have, we know everything there is to know about the system. Now, after the black hole has finished evaporating, Alice, or the left particle, is gone from the system altogether. And so what that means is that the final state is just the state of the right particle. And that is not a pure state. That's a density matrix. It's a mixed state. And this is evidenced by the fact that its von Neumann entropy is log 2, which is not 0. And so we find that the entropy has increased. The system was not evolving unitarily and we have lost information. So here's another, a more pictorial way of, uh, of, of thinking about this. So let's imagine that we have a bunch of matter and we're going to collapse it into a black hole. And this matter is all in a pure state. So we're forming a black hole from a pure state. 
and we want to compute the, the, Hawking, the entropy of the Hawking radiation as it then evaporates. What do we mean by the entropy of the Hawking radiation? That is the entropy of quantum fields outside the black hole. The radiation is the stuff that stays outside of the black hole. So before the black hole really starts evaporating, everything is in the pure state, the entropy is going to be zero. Now, as the black hole begins to evaporate, we have this, we can think of this in terms of these bell pairs, and the black hole entropy, the entropy of the radiation, S Hawking, this Hawking referring to the fact that Hawking did this calculation, it begins to increase. But that's okay. For now, we have two interacting systems. We have the radiation and we have the black hole. And this is now an open system, and so it's okay for the entropy to be increasing. The entropy is allowed to increase because we don't expect that, one of the, that just one of these is going to have a constant entropy since they're allowed to interact. Now, as the black hole continues to evaporate, the radiation entropy is going to keep on increasing and to, until eventually the black hole evaporates altogether. And all we have left is just the radiation. So now we don't have the excuse anymore that the radiation is just part of the system. Now what's left is just the radiation. The entire universe is just the radiation. And yet the radiation is saturated at the thermal value. And so that means that the radiation doesn't have zero entropy after the black hole finishes evaporating. The end state is not pure. And the end state is the state of the entire universe. So the entire universe went from a pure state down here to a mixed state up here. And now there's no other subsystem that we can blame this on. We have lost information in this process. And this was Hawking's calculation in 1975. So what we found is that a pure state in a closed system evolves to a mixed state and information is lost. Non we have non-unitary behavior. So we can ask, is quantum gravity non-unitary? Maybe there are non-perturbative corrections that somehow fix this. And what would a unitary entropy curve look like? Well, the unitary entropy curve is uh, called the page curve. This is named for page, after page for proposing it. And it looks like this. Why does it look like that? Well, for one, we say, you know what, it's got, what it has to look like at the end, because for a unit, in a unitary process, if the entropy begins at zero, and then for a while you have these two systems interacting, but at the end, when you're com computing the entropy of the full system again, it has to be zero again. So you know that the entropy has to go up and it has to come back down. You can of course do a much more detailed calculation and find that the turnover happens right around the time that the black hole has evaporated half its mass. That is the time at which the radiation now knows in some sense about more than half the system and can start to purify itself in a very rough sense. So which of these is the correct curve for quantum gravity? And how do we calculate this curve in quantum gravity? Now this is where I, I like to pause for a moment and say how catastrophic it would be if the correct curve in quantum gravity were information loss because information loss is, is a, it's a loss of predictability in physics. It's not just that it's unappealing in the sense that we haven't seen it. It's also a loss of predictability or postdictability that if we have access to the state at late times, then we can't evolve it in a deterministic way backwards to get the original state, the original way that we prepared the black hole. And that's, uh, that, that's very troublesome in, in physics. So one of the reasons to be on the team of the unitary curve is that we don't have to worry, that we don't have to deal with this type of uh, loss of predictability. And also because, well, we think quantum mechanics is unitary. So now that we've asked the question, what is the correct uh, curve for the entropy in quantum gravity and how do we calculate it? I come to the section on the tools, the age of holographic entanglement entropy and how we use this tool to essentially compute the page curve, compute the curve for the dependence of the von Neumann entropy on time in an evaporating black hole. Before I do that, let me just give a, brief, a bit of a preview as to where we're going. From the perspective of semi-classical gravity, 
it's hard to see where Hawking's analysis goes wrong. It looks very robust. And so it would seem that what we need is an ingredient from quantum gravity to help us figure this out. Now, what we found in the new developments is that actually, you can do a completely semi-classical calculation and still get a unitary page curve, but only if you interpret that calculation in a way that is inherited from quantum gravity. And when I say inherited from quantum gravity, I mean inherited from holography, which, is, which can be thought of as a formulation of quantum gravity. And so holography is critical to our understanding, to the, these newfound understanding. Now, there have been more recent developments that have used, again, this general interpretation that you could say maybe a, apart from holography, but the interpretation still comes from holography itself. So I said the word holography a lot in the last, uh, last minute or two. So let me now remind all of you, if you haven't seen this before, introduce you to what holography is. So ADS-CFT, we also call it, or holography, also known sometimes as gauge gravity duality, is a duality between quantum gravity with anti-de-sitter boundary conditions, which you can think of as just quantum gravity in a box, which we call the bulk, and a lower dimensional non-gravitational quantum field theory, which we call the boundary. So the caricature that you see here is usually a soup can, and you say the soup is this quantum gravity bulk, and on the, the label, uh, the back of the soup can is this d-dimensional gauge theory, which is non-gravitational. So here we have a duality between a gravitational theory in a box and a non-gravitational theory. Now, this in principle is expected to hold, it's a conjecture, it's expected to hold in a limit where quantum gravity, uh, in any limit of quantum gravity, even when it's strongly coupled. But Normally, when, when we work with this, because we don't know how to deal with non perturbative quantum gravity, we usually work with semi-classical gravity in the bulk. What is the most important thing that uh, holography has told us about the information paradox up until 2019? Well, there have been quite a few of them, but I would say the first insight is that a black hole is just another quantum system. And in particular, a black hole in ADS is an ordinary, is just described by a state of an ordinary non-gravitational quantum system so in one lower dimension. So this is the sort of beautiful holographic picture where you have some black hole here, maybe you have some strings, some quantum gravity mess. But on the boundary, it's just described as a, and just an ordinary quantum state, maybe a thermal state. Now, we know that the quantum field theory, the non-gravitational quantum field theory evolves unitarily. But if it involves unitarily and it's describing all of the quantum gravity processes in the bulk, for example, black hole evaporation, that immediately implies that quantum black holes also evolve unitarily. So is this it? Are we done? Have we solved the information paradox? Is you have unitarity, that's it. Um, yeah, it's great and we can celebrate, but it's not really satisfactory in the sense that this is a type of resolution, one could say, of the information paradox that doesn't actually teach us all that much about deep quantum gravity. We want to understand in the language of quantum gravity why it's unitary. What is the mechanism in quantum gravity that helps the information get out of the evaporating black hole? And so we would want to know, is ADS-CFT gives us this answer, but does it also give us more? Does it give us enough to determine the mechanism by which the information escapes the quantum grab in quantum gravity language? So what is the idea here? What is it that we want to see? What we want to do? We already know if we compute the entropy in the bulk via the usual formula, in some sense the Hawking formula, it's not Hawking's formula, but this is the Hawking idea. We say the von Neumann entropy of a bulk state, so these are time slices of the bulk, so we're evaluating at every time slice, is so this is minus trace row bulk log row bulk. If we evaluate it in this way, we know we get what I'm going to call the Hawking curve. That is, we get information loss. So row bulk here, again, this is the state, the density matrix that describes quantum fields outside the horizon. So at this time t before, this is before a horizon has formed. So this is this entire slice, this entire moment of time. During 
we're going to row bulk is everything outside of this red circle here. So this is the state of quantum fields, just if you trace out everything inside of the event horizon. And then we also evaluate the entropy at row bulk at t after, which is once, it, once more a complete time slice of the universe. So we know if we do this in ADS or in flat space, we're still going to find information loss by the Hawking curve. Now, we also know that if we just look at the back of the soup can and we compute the entropy, well, we have, this is row boundary, the state of the boundary before, during, and after, corresponding to the same times as I labeled before in the bulk. So again, this is in the non-gravitational lower dimensional theory. And we just use this usual formula. Again, minus trace row, row boundary log row boundary. Then we get a unitary result. So we have these two contradictory answers. We know which one we actually believe. We believe the CFT answer because that's the answer that comes that is equivalent to the answer we get from quantum gravity. But we, we still have this contradiction. So the idea is that we want to compute the entropy of the boundary CFT, which we know is unitary, but we want to do it from the bulk. We want to use this gravitational bulk language to compute the entropy as it is seen on the boundary in the boundary theory, which is unitary. So how do we do this, given that we know if we use minus trace row bulk row log row bulk, we get a non-unitary answer? Well, we use the holographic dictionary that relates entropy on the boundary to gravitational quantities in the bulk. And rather remarkably, it turns out that if you do a holographic calculation of the entropy, so you compute, you use the holographic dictionary, you do a gravitational calculation, and you use this dictionary to convert it into a boundary entropy, then you do get a unitary page curve. And so that tells you how you do a calculation in gravity language that gives you a unitary answer, even if you're working in semi-classical gravity. So how do we do this calculation? Well, this leads me to the, uh, the really critical entry in the holographic dictionary relating bulk and boundary, which is the holographic entanglement entropy proposal. Now, there are three layers of it that I'm going to talk about today. The first one is if we're working purely in general relativity, we're not including any quantum corrections at all, we're not worrying about any of that stuff, everything is classical. This is called the Ryu Takianagi or also Hubini Rangamani Takianagi pres prescription. And this is what it says. It says if you have some state, some density matrix rho in the CFT, in your, in your uh, lower dimensional quantum field theory, the non-gravitational one, and you want to compute its von Neumann entropy, then what you do is you compute the area of a surface X over 4G H bar. What is X? X is a special kind of surface that we call an extremal surface. What that means is that if you take the surface X and you slightly perturb its location, then its area doesn't change to a leading order in the perturbation. So it's a local extremum of the area functional in curved space. If you have multiple surfaces that are local extrema of the area functional, then you pick the one that has the smallest area. So basically, if you have multiple saddle points, you pick the saddle with the smallest value. For example, in the stationary black hole, the extremal surface that computes the entropy that enters into this lies on the event horizon. And this is a stationary black hole, so the event horizon area does not change with time. And in fact, this gives you a beautiful answer. The von Neumann entropy of a uh, stationary black hole is the area of the event horizon of a 4G H bar. Some of you will remember this was Bekenstein's proposal. So this is the story for the purely classical, uh, purely classical limit with no quantum effects. But remember, I had that slide earlier that said how critical quantum effects are for understanding black hole thermodynamics and of course for the information paradox. So we don't want to work in this regime. We want to include additional quantum corrections, which leads me to the second layer, which, uh, by, which is a proposal by Faulkner, Lukowitz, and Maldacena, holographic entanglement entropy with quantum fields. So in the next order in perturbation theory, what we do is we include quantum fields propagating on our space time, but we don't allow them to interact with the metric. So our quantum field theory and our uh, general relativity are still decoupled, but we are at least considering the possibility that there are quantum fields in the problem. 
And this actually already at this level, this changes the formula relating boundary entropy to bulk gravitational quantities. It changes it in the following way. We still have this area of the extremal surface over 4GH bar, but now we're adding a bulk entropy term to it. So this rho out of x is the state of quantum fields outside of this, of this extremal surface x here. So this is x. This here is the boundary, the, the, um, the boundary of the soup, the, the ends of the soup can. And this state, this density matrix rho out of x is the state of the quantum fields between x and the boundary of the soup can. So what we do is we compute the von Neumann entropy of this bulk, these bulk uh, quantum fields, and we add it to the area of this extremal surface over 4G h bar. And this gives us what we call the generalized entropy. So the sum of these two is termed the generalized entropy of this surface X. So here, we haven't changed the surface X, we've just added an additional correction term to it. But of course, we actually need our, our space time to be affected by the quantum fields. For the black hole to be evaporating, we actually need to be considering interactions perturbative small interactions, but nonetheless, we do need these interactions between our gravitational system and the quantum fields. So we actually have to work to higher order in perturbation theory, where the quantum fields are actually interacting with the metric. And so to, to all higher orders, there's another proposal um, by myself and Aaron Wall, which looks very similar to the last one, but has a critical difference. So here we have the uh, von Neumann entropy again of the boundary. And it looks very similar, right? It's the area of a surface X, surface chi in this case, over 4G H bar, plus the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields that lie outside of chi. So it's the generalized entropy of some surface chi. The critical difference between this prescription and the last one, which is going to make all the difference between information conservation and information loss, is that this chi is a different surface. This is not the surface whose, where, which extremizes the area. It's not the surface where small perturbations of it do not change the area to first order. Rather, it is a surface that extremizes this sum, the generalized entropy. This is the surface that we call a quantum extremal surface. Small variations of this surface do not change the, uh, the, the, the generalized entropy of it to leading order. So this is the quantum extremal surface, which is the appropriate prescription if you want to work in what we call the semi-classical regime, where you allow perturbative interactions between your, uh, your bulk quantum fields and your gravitational system and the gravity. So this is the, the really critical tool in our arsenal. And that brings me to uh, the information paradox now. Right? Now we have all the tools to move forwards. So what, what is it that we do to get this unitary page curve from purely a semi-classical analysis? So let's consider an evaporating ADS black hole. Usually this is where I get stopped. What do you mean you're considering an evaporating ADS black hole? ADS black holes don't evaporate. Uh, actually, large ADS black holes don't evaporate. And by conservation of misery, even though small ones evaporate, we don't understand them. So that, for, that means that it seems we're a bit at a loss. How are we going to even model the evaporation of ADS black holes? Well, we're just going to have to force it. We forced a large ADS black hole to evaporate, essentially by extracting the Hawking radiation by hand and throwing it into an external reservoir. So here is a, a diagram of how that works. You have some, uh, you have the bulk here. This is the bulk system. And we imagine that there is a bath here, perhaps bath is the wrong word because this thing is very, very cold. It's colder than the black hole. And at some point we basically couple these two. So over here, we have reflecting boundary conditions at the edge of the box. So there's no interaction between them. But at some point we impose transparent boundary conditions and now the two are allowed to interact. And essentially what happens is that the bulk evaporates into the bath and this is a way to force a large ADS black hole to evaporate. And of course, what we hope is that the evolution of the full system is going to be unitary. 
So what is the calculation that we're going to do? We already know that if we do the Hawking calculation, we're going to get non-unitary answer. So we're going to attempt to do the holographic calculation to try to get the answer from the CFT, the answer from the boundary theory, but using gravitational language so we can understand better how quantum gravity implements unitarity in the evaporation process. So what is the, so at early times, what happens? At early times, the quantum extremal surface is actually the empty set. So the area of the empty set is zero, and the von Neumann entropy is then evaluated on an entire time slice because we've always evaluated, evaluated everywhere outside of the quantum extremal surface. And outside of the quantum extremal surface, if the quantum extremal surface is the empty set, it's just everywhere. So we evaluated an entire moment of time, that's rho all. And as the black hole evaporates into the external system, the von Neumann entropy of rho all, which is to say the state on this entire moment of time, it increases. Now, after the black hole has evaporated half its mass, something very interesting happens. A quantum extremal surface with a smaller generalized entropy than the empty set appears. So we have a new quantum extremal surface. It sits slightly behind the event horizon, and its generalized entropy is smaller than the generalized entropy of the empty set. So we actually have to now substitute in this quantum extremal surface formula, instead of the area of the empty set of a 4GH bar plus the von Neumann entropy of, of everything outside the horizon, of everything uh, in, in the bulk, we have to instead say the area of this chi over 4GH bar plus the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields outside of it. What is the effect of this? The effect of this is actually to create a downturn in the unitary, in the page curve, in the curve for the entropy. And so we find, as a consequence of this new quantum extremal surface, the curve, the dependence of the entropy on, the, on time actually de decreases. And using the quantum extremal surface prescription for entropy, instead of the naive Hawking calculation, gives us unitary evolution. Well, at least it gives us the page curve, which is extremely indicative and is a hallmark of unitary evolution. And of course, this calculation we can do using only semi-classical physics. So let's take a step back for a moment. What happened here? Well, we computed the von Neumann entropy of the boundary. And we could compute it on the boundary using boundary quantities, but that's not helpful for us because we want to understand information conservation in quantum gravity language. And so instead we computed it using the holographic dictionary we said, this is, the quantum, this is the generalized entropy of the quantum extremal surface. And the state here that went into this von Neumann entropy is exactly the state that would have given us the Hawking answer if we hadn't corrected it with this area of this surface over 4GH bar. So this is what computes the entropy of a Hawking radiation as predicted by quantum gravity. Now, Let's pause for a moment and ask, well, the only place where quantum gravity actually appeared is in the interpretation of the generalized entropy as the entropy of the radiation. So what, what microscopic physics justifies the quantum extremal surface prescription? You know, we, we want to understand, now we, we've made this huge step forward. We know how to calculate a unitary page curve, but now we want to ask more. We want to ask, well, what is it in quantum gravity that means that this is the right way to calculate entropy in a, in, within quantum gravity. Why is this the right formula? Why, why was Hawking's formula wrong? So this brings, leads me to uh, different ways of calculating entropy. If we don't include gravity, even then the von Neumann entropy, entropy can be difficult to calculate directly. So we often use something called the replica trick. What does that mean? Well, it means we, we represent this minus trace rule of rho is then there's a limit of this quantity here, where rho to the n is n copies of the state rho. Again, this is you computing the von Neumann entropy of some density matrix rho. So now let's do, we want to do a gravitational calculation. So we want to do a gravitational calculation of the entropy. We want to justify, again, the quantum extremal surface prescription. 
So how do we do that, given that we also know that this is the right formula for von Neumann entropies? Well, we're going to use this replica trick. <coughs> we can relate trace rho, or equivalently trace rho to the n, to the partition function of a system. In particular, in ADS-CFT, we can relate a partition function to something called the gravitational path integral. So here with the gravitational partition function, sorry, the partition function for an unnormalized state rho to the n can be computed using the standard path integral calculation, but evaluated on n copies of the geometry in which the CFT lives. So we have this, this CFT partition function, the partition function of the boundary theory, can be evaluated in terms of this object called the gravitational path integral. And if you have n copies, because for the uh, replica trick, we need n copies of this, then you can just evaluate the, you, you just consider n copies of the CFT, n copies of the partition function. So what is this gravitational path integral? Well, it's very similar to um, any other path integral. This is a, an integral with boundary conditions. So this is the boundary of your um, space-time manifold. They're fixed to be some boundary B. And you integrate over all possible metrics. So, and, and of course, you have the fixed gravitational action. And we often com compute this using a saddle point approximation. So we have some dominant saddle, maybe working on shell. This, this, uh, we, we just compute this using some saddle point approximation here. And that means that this trace row to the n we can relate to a quantity that is computed with space to, from space times with n disconnected boundaries. Again, rho to the n can be computed in terms of n copies, the partition function of n copies of the boundary, which via this gravitational path integral prescription tells us that we can compute trace rho to the n, which again appears in the, in the replica trick, in terms of a quantity where your boundary conditions are n copies of the asymptotic boundary. So let's, uh, let's try to concretize this just with, with, say, just two boundaries. We want to compute the partition function for two boundaries, rho squared. So what do we do? We take two identical copies of AES boundary conditions, and we work in Euclidean signature. That means that we, instead of working with uh, Lorentzian time, we work with Euclidean time. T goes to I tau. Basically, what this means is that their boundary conditions look like circles. And what we do is we say, all right, we're going to ask what is the gravitational path integral calculating when we force it to have boundary conditions of these two <coughs> disconnected boundaries. So we do a saddle point approximation and we ask what are the solutions? And it turns out that there are two saddle points. There is this one, which is just Euclidean, uh, standard Euclidean ADS, and it's just two disconnected solutions. And then there is this very exotic saddle that actually connects these two boundaries. Now, this is all very abstract, but there is a crux of the point here, which is that you would never have expected this weird thing to actually dominate the gravitational path integral, because this is a, this is a non-trivial topology, which is not something we expect to see in semi-classical gravity. And yet things work out so that exactly when we need to go from the increasing page curve to the decreasing page curve, and we need, and we see this in the gravitational picture as a switch over between the empty set and this non-trivial quantum extremal surface chi, that is a switch in dominance between this disconnected saddle in the path integral and this connected saddle, this disconnected uh, saddle and this wormhole. So that is the, that is this gravitational replica trick, this gravitational interpretation of the replica trick is what is telling us that one way of understanding this jump from the empty set to this new quantum extremal surface, which is essential for unitarity, is as a switchover between the dominance of two saddles in the gravitational path integral. All right, so what's, uh, what is that good for? Well, the first thing we ask is actually, should we include these exotic wormhole topologies? Should they be allowed to contribute to the gravitational path integral? Well, the problem is that the solution is this connected Euclidean wormhole. 
And without going into the details of it, what, it ha what happens with it is that it results in non-trivial correlations between these n boundaries. Now, that might not seem like such a problem until you think about what that means. These n boundaries correspond to n quantum field theories that are completely independent of one another. Why should there be correlations between them? They should factorize. Everything should factorize. There shouldn't be any correlations between these n independent quantum field theories. Having these correlations between these n independent copies of the same system just doesn't seem possible in a single quantum theory. And so the fact that the path integral on n copies of the boundary is not the same as the path integral raised to the power n would suggest that the partition function of n copies of the same in system is not the same as the partition function multiplied by itself n times. And that seems completely against any kind of any, anything that we would understand about quantum field theory. A single quantum, if this just single quantum theory, then these things should all factorize. So this doesn't seem possible. Well, what, what are some possibilities? Well, one possibility that has been discussed in the literature is that the gravitational path integral doesn't actually compute the partition function, but it computes an ensemble average, an average over couplings or over theories. Another possibility is that there's some non-perturbative corrections that, that restore factorization, which leads me to what we're thinking about now. So this, this is the, uh, what I call the clever gravitational path integral. We are pretty sure that these exotic topologies are legal in the sense that they, we, they should be included. After all, they give us unitarity, but they bring a different question up. What is the gravitational path integral calculating? Is it calculating an ensemble average? Is it calculating something that, that needs non perturbative corrections? What is it doing? We have learned that it's not computing exactly the partition function. Now, we do have one exact example where we have some understanding of what it's doing, which is, what's, which is 2D dilaton gravity, where in the boundary language, it appears to be doing a disorder average. So the path integral into the dilaton gravity is doing something like a disorder average, which suggests that the path integral is doing an average over theories. But it's not clear what this means, how that's supposed to work in higher dimensions where we're pretty sure that we actually have an exact duality between a single quantum theory and the bulk. What is it going to be averaging over? Is there, is there some kind of a disorder? What I would argue is pretty clear is that we have pinned down a key ingredient in the resolution of the information paradox. The gravitational path integral, somehow it knows, it knows about unitarity and whatever it is, whatever calculation it's doing, it's a black box that we need to unlock. We have to understand what exactly it's calculating and why it is so smart. Why does it know what it knows? And so this leads me to the current state of the information paradox, the spoilers that we haven't solved it yet. Some questions that we are asking ourselves, or at least in my opinion, we should be asking ourselves. What entropy is the gravitational path integral actually calculating? And how do we calculate it using minus trace rho log rho? What is the rho that we need to plug in to calculate minus trace rho log rho in, in quantum gravity language and get a unitary answer? What does an observer outside the black hole actually measure? They all, everything we've talked about so far are litmus tests and hallmark features of unitarity. But what about what an observer actually measures? If we could make arbitrarily accurate measurements and we had an arbitrarily good quantum computer, would we, upon feeding these measurements to our computer, would we find a pure state? Would we find a mixed state? Is the path integral doing an averaging over what? Over couplings, over theories? Is the semi-classical limit of gravity just an approximate description of an ensemble? And where did Hawking actually go wrong? Yeah, we can talk about it. He didn't include the quantum extremal surface, but we can't go through his calculation and say, aha, this is where he forgot something. What calculation was Hawking doing in the language of holographic entanglement entropy? And so with that, I will end and thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, Netta, very much. We can all clap either. Oh, we can't see video, yeah. So if you wanna clap as your uh, little Zoom thing, that's great.
Um, good. So we're now we now have time for questions. I was told that if you raise your hand in Zoom by clicking on participants and then raising your hand, uh, I will see it and I can call on you to ask questions. But I am not. Also try. Someone has okay. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't see any hands up. If you have any questions, uh, maybe typing them into the Q and A is the right thing to do, unless uh, Kopi tells me that I'm doing something wrong here and just not seeing the questions. So, Netta, let me start by asking you a question. Yes, um, it's it's a very simple question. Can you just like say more about this procedure of um, putting the black hole in a bag? Like you're adding something to ADS CFT. And I'm sure it's all fine, but it, it certainly goes beyond my experience in doing these things. So maybe this will be an opportunity for you to uh, let us be more comfortable with that part of the process. Absolutely. Yeah. So you do have to work with this very carefully. Um, and I will say that we've only really established that it works without any problems, like various uh, traveling gravitons destroying our asymptotic boundary or anything like that. Um, I would say we've established that works for sure in two dimensions. So if we work with the Jakeep tidal boom gravity, with Dilton, 2D Dilaton gravity with ADS boundary conditions, then what is very nice about this is that we can consider black hole evaporation in the following setup. We take the matter, the bulk matter, to be a conformal field theory. And we take our auxiliary system, this cold bath, to also be the same quantum field, the same conformal field theory, but in this ground state. And what we are doing here essentially is we are, when we couple the two, we impose transparent boundary conditions. And the reason we can do this without incurring any, uh, any catastrophes is that we can just do a conformal uh, rescaling of the, of the bulk. And because we're working on conformal field theory, this just becomes a state in flat space, which is, uh, which is I mean, you have, you have the ground state and then you have it this a different state and there's an interface between the two, but we know how to deal with this in, uh, in CFT. So we, we, so, and we don't have to worry about the gravitons traveling in in any way. Uh, so this, so this coupling, this, it, it incurs a shock of positive energy into the bulk, but we know how to control that. Now you could worry in higher dimensions that maybe something bad happens when you do this. And I don't think that anybody has shown rigorously However, we do know that uh, JT gravity coupled to a CFT is, is a simply dimensional reduction of the magnetically charged black holes, black holes, near extremal magnetically charged black hole in four dimensions. And so we do expect that we that the same dynamics works, uh, at least in that particular case. So that there is a way to do this coupling, at least in certain four dimensional cases. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. I'm, I'm worried that, uh, oh wait, here's a question in the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, it's from, uh, I'll just read it out. It's from uh, Tommy Clark. What does this approach say about loop quantum gravity or string theory? Are there known contradictions to either? Why does this approach seem more promising to you? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the approach is bottom up in the following sense. If you are simply willing to accept that the gravitational path integral can be used to compute certain quantities like the entropy. And there is a significant history to that in the sense that you can use the gravitational path integral, the Euclidean gravitational path integral to compute um, the entropy of a black hole, the beckinstein hawking entropy for, a, for certain stationary black holes. If you accept that, then you don't need to worry about what is the UV completion of this theory. You can just say in whatever theory um, we are working in, if the gravitational path integral is a well-behaved object, and uh, then we're just going to use it to compute entropies, and it gives us a unitary answer. Now, that's not, I don't find that to be particularly satisfying. Uh, I think that it's, it's better to try to motivate why we want to use the gravitational path integral for this. And for that, that essentially is where the ADS-CFT correspondence comes in. Now, whether you think that the ADS-CFT correspondence requires string theory, or is just motivated by string theory, I think that's a matter of taste, but I would say the ads safety correspondence, while originally uh, its most original form was derived uh, in some sense from string theory, I think we've evolved to the point where we can sort of treat it on its own and just say, if you're willing to accept holography, then this works. 
And there are many reasons to accept holography. It computes a lot of things correctly. Uh, there's also various evidence from ADS-CMT where you model, imagine modeling a condensed matter system and you get the right answer with, for various questions, which is rather remarkable. So I think that ADS-CFT has a lot of evidence, uh, both theoretical evidence in its favor. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I think that this approach is, is extremely promising, which is not to say that it's not a good idea to investigate in other directions. But I think I would say that this is one of the biggest breakthroughs we've had in our approach to the black hole information paradox that we have not been able to get in other approaches so far. So is it safe to say, in other words, that even if it someday turns out that the UV completion of gravity is completely different from string theory, it's completely possible that the, the level of analysis that you're doing right now is still completely applicable and it helps us understand how it exactly. As, as long as it has a low energy limit where the gravitational path integral is doing this calculation correctly, then it'll work for that theory. So in terms of it's more universal. Okay. I think I'm not seeing any more questions. If anyone has a question, hurry up. Uh, not there. All right. Let's thank Neta again very, very much. It's later over there on the East Coast where she is. Uh, so we hope when things return to normal, we can actually see you uh, here at Caltech for a visit sometime. Thank you all for your attention and thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Neta. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.